scion of many worlds. It's freezing, Zavaya complains in Jasper sighs. You'll live. This is torture. I told you to dress warm many times, Jasper remarks as he follows Magrika through the air. She's a tiny, flappy thing up ahead as she leads him through a snowstorm and towards a vaguely visible mountain range. You're evil. You do know you can manifest heat and warmth around yourself, right? If you can bend light to the degree you do, then you can manifest a warming heat. Jasper returns. He can't really focus on babying the little idiot when he's also hauling the payment. Axiom use may let him reduce just how much space and weight it has, but he's not the best at the technique and can't just put a hundred swords in his sleeves. So his right arm is completely occupied with the swords and the left is busy with Zavia, the stubborn brat who still won't let herself be visible even if the snow is revealing her completely to even normal eyes. I hate you! If you would just shift your veil of invisibility even slightly, you would be nice and warm. Jasper returns as one of the indistinct mountains proves itself to be much closer than the others as Magrika starts to dive to the somewhat more distinct and he can spot some somewhat strange bumps on a plateau. He's kept Magrika about 10 to 20 meters ahead to give him plenty of warning yet still be in yelling distance. Her dive widened the distance considerably and he follows to Zavaya's audible protest. His wings snap out to slow their descent like a parachute when they're close to the face of the mountain. Magrika is rushing through snow deep enough that she's more digging a tunnel than plowing through. He lands near her and finds it's up to his knees. He's ten feet tall and plopping Zavaya in snow, this deep would be a bit much. So instead of just setting her down, he adjusts her to be sitting on his shoulder instead of lying on it like a sack of potatoes. It's horrible here, she protests as he scans the area. Their snow is a hard blocker to his antenna, but the lack of humidity in the air means he's not being set off. Still, many of the nearby snow drifts and bumps are likely some kind of settlement. Not too fond of the cold, I will admit that, but it's not too bad, Jasper responds as he trudges after Magrika. Who's there? A giant Urthani and someone in the snow? A voice asks. We have someone on my shoulder too, but she's being a brat and won't let herself be seen. Jasper answers the voice as one of the snowdrifts suddenly has a puff occur, and something shifts a huge amount of snow. It's revealed to be a Metak woman covered in white furs. The left side of her face looks like she tried headbutting a chainsaw and won. Auntie. Magrika announces before popping out of the snow to swoop down on her relative and tackling her to the ground. Magrika, the woman responds happily. The call of Magrika is echoed around the mostly hidden village as all the surrounding bumps and drifts reveal themselves to be little houses partially sunk into the ground, or perhaps yurts or tents of some kind. Whoa, giant Urthani, what have you been eating, girl? Someone asks him as several Metak start crowding around Jasper. You know, considering the way Magrika acts, I was expecting to be mobbed a little sooner. Jasper notes with a smile as tiny girls flutter around him like bats. We're old warriors and children around here. The young go out for fun. Hmm, that may make things more difficult. I was hoping to hire Mountain Clan warriors for some monster hunting, Jasper says and a cheer sounds out just as loud as the announcement. The younger Metak quickly scatter and talk to everyone they can, and there are dozens of blasts of snow around them as many more little homes are revealed. Well, you're a big one. Sharing a drink with you will need a whole pot, an older voice says, and Jasper looks down to see an older Metak woman with a shawl made of numerous animal faces stitched together. Sharing a drink? I'm afraid I don't understand. It's a way of saying you'll be peaceful. Hot soup between friends, Magrika calls out from the crowd nearby. Ah, that makes sense. I can sip. You don't need to worry too much about quantity. Jasper remarks kneeling down to be closer to her level. Zavaya gives out a squeak of protest and smacks him in the head. 
he barely feels it. There's another with you? Zavaya, the deposed queen of Miru, now my ward. Your ward? She's a child who's been lied to her entire life and I'm a believer in redemption. So I'm trying to teach her to be a better person, but she's throwing a snit fit. I am not throwing a fit, Zavaya snaps. She won't even admit that she's being childish or letting anyone see her, Jasper explains. And the old Metak just looks at him oddly before letting out a long snort of amusement. Oh, I need a proper story. Let's get some soup bubbling. I need to know what the hell Magrika just brought to us. Work, I have. Over the soup. We're talking over the soup. The older Metak says, grabbing onto his cape with something that flies out of her shawl and yanks him along. He follows and the living darkness retracts under her shawl. It reveals itself as it snaps back into place. She's out of the snow and discernible to his antenna. She's missing her arms. Her wings are all she has to manipulate the world around her. It's part of a pattern for all older members of the community. Massive scars, missing limbs, missing eyes, the luckier ones are just down a few fingers or walk with a pronounced limp. Oddly enough, or perhaps not, none of them are missing wings. He had been told that their wings are reportedly indestructible and capable of shape-shifting. He'd seen them shift, but this is the first real evidence of them being indestructible. You've got a lot in your head, the armless Metak elder states. Yes. He admits, somewhat surprised, she can read him with her back turned. Easy to tell with Orthani, the ringing noise changes, she states. Speaking of what do you know about? Over the soup, Biggie. Over the soup, she announces. It's freezing, Zavaya complains. Use the energy around you and warm yourself. Stop focusing on your image and warm yourself, Jasper chides her. I will not use a lesser element. Zavaya snaps. How is heat an element? It's a byproduct of light, fire, and friction. It's not an element, Jasper argues. You, you're my enemy, why would you? I am not your enemy child. I'm the first ally you've had that didn't lie to you. Let yourself be warm. There's nothing strong or wise in endlessly hiding. Who here are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to hide from? I can see you easily. These people don't know you. What are you trying to do? She doesn't answer him. Fussy child? Yes, she can't find a good answer, so she's just clamming up, Jasper replies. What does that even mean? Zavaya demands. Clams are a type of shelled creature on Earth. They're characterized by holding their shells tight to keep themselves safe. So clamming up means keeping quiet because your mouth is as tightly closed as a clamshell. Earth? So they're in the... No! Over soup! We talk over soup! The armless Metak starts to ask before stopping herself. Jasper chuckles in amusement. She leads him to one of the partially unveiled little buildings and puffs out the entrance. The entrance is huge. Why, over soup, she answers and he just chuckles as he follows her in. Zavaya is set down at last and she darts over onto the pelts, still invisible and shivering. For God's sake, girl, warm yourself. Jasper scolds her even as he closes the tent flap somewhat. It won't keep out the cold, but it will keep out the wind. The inside of these buildings are enormous, easily tall enough for him to stand up straight without issue. But it's clearly a Metak home. The furniture is tiny and quickly carved. A great deal of swooping lines are used to decorate most things, often moving in pairs in a design similar to wings. Sit down, she orders as she tosses a few small bricks of something into a pot before pouring out a large vase of water into it. She then puts her shape-shifted wings on the pot and it starts to quickly heat up and is steaming in moments. A trinity of bowls are used to scoop out some of the stew, the brick being revealed to be a large mass of ingredients that were then pressed together for long-term storage. The smell is meaty and cheesy at the same time. Thank you, Jasper says as he takes the bowl offered to him. 
One is held out to where Zavaya's teeth are audibly chattering. No move is made to the drink. Zavaya, it is rude and undignified to refuse your host's generosity. I, girl, I can hear that you're freezing from here. All who treat with the mountain clans do it over hot soup. Eat the soup. It will put warmth into you, the elder Maytak says. And after a few moments, Zavaya takes the bowl even as she fades into visibility. Then she goes still as Jasper drapes his cape over her for warmth. She looks at him oddly and stares for a few moments. I... I don't understand you. I'm trying to help you. You just refuse to see it, Jasper tells her. You came to us for a reason. No one brings their daughter, their wife, and an armory of weapons for no cause. How do you... Not everyone's forgotten the way things were. Magrika doesn't. She's young and unscarred. She thinks she's still invincible. She might even prove herself to be. The elder states before sipping her soup, something that Jasper does to his own. It's incredibly savory and he has to resist just gulping it down. There are some that remember, and we of the mountains remember clearly, she says before pointing upwards. Jasper follows the wing hand and his jaw drops. There are numerous images of a hexagon within a hexagon and an X dead center, the exact pattern of the defensive array. Some of them show lighter hues on the fabric crashing down into them to signify some kind of attack. Tiny figures flying away from the hexagons to what look like inverted Vs or more likely mountains. There were no men on the outpost. We couldn't afford the distraction, and there have been none since. But we remembered. We kept it with the old to send the young to see the world with untainted eyes. Have them come back and then learn the tales of old. What was the outpost for? I assumed it was for pirates. Pirates? Was it not pirates that brought the other races? No. The Urthani, Lirak, Erementa, Saramali, and Nagasha were part of a colony ship heading to this world to build homes. What was the outpost for? Jasper asks in near awe. Of course, someone would keep a record. He's just been too busy to do some serious rooting around. No Metak knows. I've spoken to most elders. We don't know at all. We were hired to help protect the outpost. The Jorgwa and Foza were working in it. But we were here to keep beasts away and often camped away from the outpost. Then the sky caught fire and most of us were killed. The few survivors fled north to take shelter in the magnetic interference of these mountains. She explains and Jasper nods. Did you actually understand that? Because I know the words but not the meaning. Do you know what a lodestone is? He asks after a moment of thought. A rock that sticks to metal. She answers right away. Like that, but more subtle. These mountains are a type of lodestone that confuses technology that searches for things. The power of a lodestone is called magnetic force. If you use a magnetic force as used to hide something, deliberately or not, then it's magnetic interference. Understand? I think so. This is some kind of camouflage, she asks, and Jasper nods. She nods herself and takes a sip before suddenly sucking in a half lungful of the soup and choking for a moment. Are you all right? He asks, reaching around to pat her on the back gently. Names! We forgot to give names, she coughs. I am Jasper Emmanuel Skidderway Blue. I'm a sergeant in the Titan Squad of the Undaunted, a military organization that's sending rescue to this world even as we speak. Really? The lost miracles are coming back? I'll get my arms and youth back? Likely. They're still weeks away, though. I'm 58 years old. I've dozed through longer, she declares before blinking. Also, my name is Balkatha. I'm Magrika's great aunt and help raise the little hellion. I taught her just how many tricks with the wings there are. Neat. I take it you have some kind of historical record of what happened. Only in the oldest caches and only elders are allowed in them. While my body is a few hundred years old, I think that rates is elderly. Jasper quips and gets a bit of a glare. Uh-huh, sure thing, Junior, Bolkatha says before taking a gulp of her soup. 
I'll be honest with you. I don't trust what you have to say. You've shown up in fancy armor with my grand niece gushing about you. But you're the first man on this world and I don't know how long. So that means things are changing and that means I can't trust old patterns. Now, I believe you when you say that there's help coming. There's a lot of value to a world like this, especially if someone wants to look like a big hero. Fair enough. So does that mean you believe me when I say I want to hire out members of your tribe to hunt monsters so we can feed Miru and Greenstone? What's in it for you? I've conquered Miru and am brokering peace with Greenstone. Feeding them helps me. Okay. And are those swords the pay? As many warriors as they'll get me, I need monsters killed and delivered to the capitals from there. Water Aramenta will dry out the meat for preservation and a lot of lives can be saved. Seems easy enough. What do you know about the other people? You say they were from something called a colony ship. How do you know? I've got a communication device, a radio. I was able to speak with other undaunted and they relayed the information to me. The colony ship was called The Nest. A lot of records are degraded, but a list of racial accommodations, a complete blueprint, and a passenger manifest are still available. So I have access to not only what the ship was built like, but who was on it and what little bits it had on it to keep everyone comfy. I see. So why did they shoot on the outpost? It wasn't them. The Nest did not have the kind of power needed to destroy the outpost as thoroughly as it's been destroyed. It might have roughed it up, but in a fight between the two, the outpost would have shredded the nest, unless it had no weapons but you girls. No, there were weapons, big ones. They were apparently fired, shooting light into the sky. Then more light came down and burned the world away. Lasers then? Are you sure things were in that order? Yes, the outpost shot first. So it was an outpost and not a base? Was there any hint what it was about? What the outpost was doing? It used that symbol, but we do not know what it means anymore. She says, pointing to one of the posts that keep the roof up. Carved into it is a pair of squares, one above the other. To their right is a triangle pointing away. It looks like a company logo. Hmm. He notes putting it to memory. Not pirates, an outpost though. A legal outpost, perhaps? Then why wasn't it registered? Why didn't the Nest know about them? 